is to identify long-term spatial patterns in common snook and red drum. Next slide. So we get a lot of questions from recreational fishermen and charter guides about the fishery when we're out on the water. Most of the concerns we hear about are the state of the red drum populations and the size of the snook. Um, they are often curious to know if there are less red drum in the harbor, if the fish are smaller than historical sizes. Uh, many have made the observation that there are less of the large schools of red drum and they're not catching them where they used to. Similar inquiries are made about the snook. Many fishermen think that the overall numbers of snook are down and there are less big fish to catch out there as well. Next slide. I am part of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission Fisheries Independent Monitoring Program. We have seven labs throughout the state of Florida monitoring estuarine fish populations. Uh, the FIM program was established in 1985 with, there we go. Uh, with routine monitoring beginning, beginning in 1989, so you can see we are able to put together some very long-term data sets. Uh, this is one of the biggest benefits of our program, the long-term data sets using consistent effort and sampling techniques. Additionally, we use a random sampling design that removes the location bias faced by monitoring uh, based on recreational and commercial fishing. Our data are a very important component of stock assessments and are used in various reports and publications and influence commercial and recreational fishing regulations. Uh, next slide. Uh, what are we trying to identify with this study? Uh, the first question was, do red drum and snook share high use areas within the harbor? Do red drum use the same hot spots year after year? And is there a difference in hotspot distribution during spawning season for snook? Next slide. The field sampling technique that we used was the 183 meter seine. Uh, this is a net that's set, of the back, set out of the back of our boats and is always along a shoreline or a shoal like you see in the picture on the right. The net is then retrieved by hand and everything that is caught is identified to the lowest taxon possible it's measured and counted as well. Next slide. For this study, we use the Geddes Ord hotspot analysis run through ArcGIS, which spatially defines statistically significant hotspots and cold spots by comparing each sample's end value with each of its neighbor's end value within a designated distance band. Uh, these distance bands were determined through using a global Moran's test, which outputs a z-score with peaks at distances where spatial clustering is best defined. This study was done in two parts. The first was over a 21-year combined analysis to see where the overall significant hotspots were. And for the second part, we separated the data into three-year time increments to look at it temporally to see if those hotspots and cold spots were shifting in the harbor at all. Additionally, we split the snook into spawning periods. Uh, May through October would be their non-spawning period and November through April. Or no, their spawning periods are May through October and their non-spawning periods were November through April. So because we catch snook as adults in the harbor, we wanted to account for that differential catch rate due to their spawning aggregations. Um, for red drum, we only catch them as juveniles, so we did not split them. Next slide. For this study, we did a total of 4,284 net sets. Um, in the graphs we see on the y-axis, it's showing the mean catch per unit of effort per three-year period, and the x-axis shows that three-year period. Uh, there is a fluctuation in snook catches, primarily due to the cold kill we saw in 2010, while the red drum remained relatively stable throughout the data set. Next slide. So these maps display all of the net sets we did in the 21 years. And to orient you with the map, the red spots indicate hot areas, while the blue spots indicate cold areas. Anything in yellow is statistically uh, not significant. So we're comparing the spawning times of snook to red drum here in these maps. I didn't include the non-spawn snook map because there was very little difference between the two snook maps. Um, immediately, we see that there are three large areas that are hot spots for red drum labeled one, Mat Lache, two, Punta Gorda, and three, the south portion of the west wall. And those spots never fall out as hot spots for snook. Some potential reasons for this are their preferred habitat types. Snook have been shown to prefer habitats that have good cover, for example, mangrove shorelines, mangrove islands, 
and they like to have those narrow channels in between those areas of coverage. Um, while red drum do use those same areas, they're also known to school up on shallow flats and forage for food. Another last noticeable separation is at number four, the north end of Turtle Bay, where we see red drum dominate the area, while the snook use the southern end labeled five. <coughs> Showing the map this way does a great job of displaying the habitat partitioning that was observed from doing this analysis. Um, there are some areas of overlap as well. We see with the black aerial arrows in the Bull Bay area and Northern Two Pines area. Next slide. So as stated earlier, in 2010, there was a massive cold kill event for snook. And taking that into account led us to observe something very interesting with both the red drum and snook for every period after that. So the 2012 through 2017, those two time periods. Uh, Turtle Bay became an area that produced higher confidence hotspots for both species in these time periods. And while they had hotspots there previously, they were in much lower confidence levels and covered less area. So one hypothesis for this that we came up with is that it could be prey driven. After the cold, air, cold kill, there's data that shows that the pinfish numbers skyrocketed and this could be an area that they were the highest in numbers which would attract both of these big predators. Next slide. Here we just see the 2015 to 2017 periods. Um, we see that both species are using that Turtle Bay area again. Okay, next slide. So for now, I just want to focus on red drum, which were the main species of concern for fishermen. Uh, red drum recruit to the estuary as juveniles, remain there for about three to four years. And in some estuaries, spawning has occurred inshore, but that has not been shown in Charlotte Harbor. And based on the size of the fish that we caught with this study, we assume them to be large juveniles. Our max fish was 761 millimeters and 50% of red drum mature at 700. So next slide. Okay, just to orient you with this new map format, it shows every three year period's hotspots circled by a different style circle and then overlaid onto one singular map. Um, it's not as important to focus on which circle goes with which period, but more just to show you the overall distribution of where the hotspots fell out, as well as the cold spots. So for red drum hotspots, they varied throughout the time periods, but were more centrally located in the harbor. Uh, they were not so much found in the sounds of the barrier islands. We see a concentration of hotspots in Bull Bay and Turtle Bay, along the east wall and in the upper harbor and rivers. Additionally, those hotspot locations were more widespread throughout the harbor and covered relatively small areas, leading to a higher number of small circles shown on the map. Uh, next slide. Nathan, if you wouldn't mind getting a little closer to your speaker, you got a little fainter there. Okay. So in this slide, we see a subset of the red drum maps depicting each individual three year period. And displaying it this way better shows the low occurrence of cold spots and how the hotspot locations change in the harbor from period to period. As you can see in the 97 and 99 map, the hotspots are located in the Panagordia area in Bull Bay in high numbers with a moderate cold spot in North Pine Island. Moving to the 0305 map, the hotspot location changes to the East Wall and Cape Hayes area more, as well as having a low percentage in Matlachea. The third map, the 09 to 11 map, shows how the hotspots move back to Panagorda and appear in the North East Wall pretty heavily as well. Next slide. Something that we thought me, might be driving those shifting hotspots of the red drum was their year class. But after much deliberation, we decided that looking at the data in three year increments is not a good way to determine this. However, the preliminary data did show that red drum of all sizes, uh, primarily we caught from 100 millimeters to 761 millimeters standard length. Um, they all utilize the same areas throughout the harbor. And to look at it this way, I only pulled those length data from the fish that fell out within the hotspots. So our size classes here are based on the size bins of Murphy and Taylor from 1990, who determined red drum size at age from Tampa Bay and Indian River Lagoon. This map shows the smallest red drum we caught, ranging from 100 millimeters to 247 millimeters. Uh, next map, or next slide. So here the red drum sizes range from 248 to 430, or age one 
and this size range had fish fall out in every three year period. And as you can see, they fell out in the same areas as the previous map with the addition of some new areas. Next map. So on this slide, the size ranges are from 431 to 613 standard length or H2. And this size also had fish in every three year period. And while the map looks almost identical to the last one, there are some subtle differences. Overall, there's not much change in the locations here, but just to reiterate what we're trying to show, um, the red drum of all sizes are utilizing all of the harbor after 61 millimeters standard length. Next. Uh, this map shows the largest of the red drum that we caught, ranging from 614 to 761 millimeters, which also had fish collected from every period. Because there are fewer spots on this map, it may appear that we lose areas that are hot spots or where they present themselves. But it's also important to know that we didn't catch as many fish in this size class. All of this leads us to believe that in conjunction with the shifting hotspots red, of red drum, they don't appear to have a propensity to their nursery habitats, unlike snook, that are known to remain in their nursery habitat for up to two years. Next slide. So moving on to snook, as explained earlier, these maps show every three year period's hotspots circled and then overlaid onto one map. So overall with snook, we see consistent high concentrations of hotspots in the Gasparilla and Bull Bay area in every period, as well as some smaller hotspots falling out near the passes in Pine Island. So I'd like to point out on this slide that the circles around the hotspots for snook cover much more area than the red drum did, and are also more consistent in where their locations fell out over time. Next slide. So just like before, this is a subset of our map collection with the same three year periods used to show red drum earlier. And overall the hotspots for non-spawning snook fell out in the Bull Bay and Turtle Bay with the 97 and 99 and the 09 to 11 having significant hotspots on the east wall. Next slide. So there's a smaller hotspot in the 97 and 99 map that fell out on the eastern part of Pine Island as well. And I highlight this spot because it exemplifies the shift to the passes that the snook hotspots display as we move to their spawning period. So keep your eye on that arrow with the red spots. Next slide. In 97 and 99, that hotspot completely shifts to the barrier islands near Captiva Pass during their spawning time. Next slide. So going back to the snook's non-spawn maps this time, I want to focus on the Bull Bay and Turtle Bay areas circled in black. Uh, during this time, the snook hotspots tend to be further inside of the harbor. Next slide. And as we transition to their spawning times, we see that there is a notice, noticeable shift in their hotspots towards the passes. Next slide. So the last area that I'd like to highlight for snook during their non-spawn time is the east wall. So on maps from 97 to 99, that first map, and the 09 to 11, the third map, there are significant hotspots in this area circled in blue. Next slide. Uh, during their spawning times, these areas have gone away completely or significantly diminished. Um, while this information isn't anything new to fisheries research, <clears throat> what it does do in this instance is validate this analysis as something that's applicable to this type of research and shows us that it can be very useful to find other trends as well. Next slide. So the conclusions we drew from the questions we asked earlier, um, the question was, do red drum and snook share high use areas within the harbor? Typically they do not. This analysis showed there was a significant amount of partitioning between snook and red drum hotspots. Occasionally hotspots overlapped and those two areas that they both show up as hotspots were the Bull Bay and the southern part of the east wall. Next slide. The next question was, do red drum use the same hotspots year after year? Uh, no. Redfish hotspot distribution was overall inconsistent compared to that of snook. Next slide. Last question was, is there a difference in hotspot distribution during spawning season for snook? Yes, this analysis displayed a noticeable shift in habitat usage between the two seasons for snook. This is a good indicator that this type of analysis is something that is applicable to this type of research. Next slide. And I'd like to thank all my coworkers and previous employees for helping to pull the nets, volunteers and interns as well, and our funding sources. And I'm ready for questions. Great. 
wonderful presentation and perfect timing. Uh, we're going to move over to Minty right now. And for those of you online, you can go into Minty.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, using code 639808 and enter any questions you have at this time. And Nathan, as soon as those are displayed, feel free to just start answering them as they come in. So the first question is, to what do you assign the difference between the FIM data and angler perceptions of fewer redfish? Uh, overall, we didn't see that much change in the amount of redfish that we caught with our data. Um, it was just concerns that we hear while we're out on the water from fishermen that they are not seeing as many redfish or they're not catching as many redfish that they used to historically. So what we did is try to answer that question for them with our data. Um, we didn't really mix anything, any data from fishermen. We just used our own film data. Uh, will this study affect bag limits at all? Uh, as of right now, we don't have any reason to believe that it would. Hopefully um, this type of uh, analysis will help make sure that we give the best and most complete data so that those um, bag limits are appropriate for the season. So the next question is, you seem to catch a lot of redfish juveniles, but not as many juvenile snook. So are your hotspots different in that they focus on different life stages? Uh, so like I said, we only use that uh, 183 meter seine and it really doesn't target those areas that we catch a lot of juvenile snook. We catch more juvenile snook in creeks and stuff with other nets, so we get some bias with the net that we used for this study. Are you seeing any effects of the harvest closure due to red tide? Um, not really. I don't know. We haven't really, I haven't seen the data for what has happened since the harvest closure from the red tide. I do know that when we had that big closure from the 2000 tide cold kill, the snook population rose pretty quickly in Charlotte Harbor. Um, it was actually a lot more quicker than any of the other harbors that FIM does this type of sampling in. Next question is, to what extent has the increase in drift algae influenced your results? Um, this study didn't really use those years that we saw that huge increase in drift algae recently. So I don't know what that would do for the hotspots. Um, but from personal experience, I do know that we are still catching quite a few, quite a few fish with our nets. All right. Well, I know that there were other questions. So for those of you who did not get your question, um, unfortunately, it looked like there's a little delay there with Minty. Um, please feel free to reach out to Nathan directly and his contact information is in the proceedings at chinep.org. With that, we're going to move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much. Next slide. Uh, 
Uh, also with FWC, Dave, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, great to join you guys for this summit again. Um, I just want to talk to you a little bit about uh, our harbor, Charlotte Harbor, um, an exceptional estuary that needs our close attention. You can uh, 